So hi everybody. Hi. Um. So again, thank you so much for joining us on the fateful seven p.m. on on when our Wednesday Wisdom Wednesday sessions. Um. Really, really happy to see all of you here, taking the time for yourself and for your practice and for your presence. And as always, I invite you to just drop whatever it is that's on your mind before this moment and drop whatever it is that you're thinking about after this moment and just come back to the now as we head into our session today with um, our venerable. Uh, we have venerable Bhikshuni Dr. Karma Lekshe Sumo today talking to us about obstacles as opportunities so we face a lot of obstacles in our lives um whether it's off the cushion like people we meet the jobs we have to do the bills we have to pay um as well as on the cushion the five hindrances and the noises that our neighbors make and you know all of that so how can we treat those obstacles as hindrances in our practice um, so before we start, I would just like to show my respect and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which this meeting takes place. I would like to respectfully acknowledge the Darug people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we stand. And a little bit about um, our venerable um, Dr. Karma Lekshe Sumo today. So um, she is a Buddhist monastic and professor of teaching at San Diego University. She began meditating in the Zen tradition in Japan in 1965, then studied with Goenka, Dalai Lama, and other teachers in India from 1972. Mm -hmm. She received novice ordination in France in 1977 and full ordination in Korea in 1982. In 2000, she received a PhD in Comparative Philosophy at the University of Hawaii, Manoa, where she is the 2023 Numata Professor of Buddhist Studies and also serves as Director of La Peace Center in Hawaii. So in 1985, Kama Lekshe Sumo founded the James Young Foundation, a non-profit organization that works to improve the education of women and girls in the Himalayan region and currently runs several schools and study programs in India and Bangladesh. At a gathering at Bodh Gaya in 1987, she became one of the founding members of the international organization Sakya Dita, Daughters of the Buddha which campaigns for gender equality in Buddhism. So today it will be an interactive session as always. Venerable will start with a short meditation and an introduction to the topic. And then I'll jump in to help facilitate a conversation. So if you have any questions um, or comments throughout the session or at the Q&A, please feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, if you don't feel comfortable sharing them with everyone, you could also send them quest the questions anonymously to me. We're very, very lucky to have Venerable join us today. I'm so excited to hear about the talk today. So without further ado, um, Venerable, over to you. Aloha, everyone. I'm speaking to you from the ancestral lands of the Hawaiian people who have preserved the land and the culture for many centuries here. Um, so, I think we'll begin with a meditation, um, maybe 15, 20 minutes of silent sitting and, well, maybe a little bit of guided meditation. Um, and first, um, please sit comfortably so you can rest your body and your mind, dropping everything else. <laughs> That's really good advice. We want to get in touch with our body, aware of our natural state, the feeling of the chair against our body. Relax into the moment, content and grateful for this body.
and also relax our mind, generating a pure intention for our practice, letting go of all worrisome thoughts, letting go of all <clears throat> regrets about the past, anxieties about the future, and just relaxing completely into this precious moment. So let's, let's turn our attention to our breathing. The most basic, the most simple, the most relaxing practice of all. Being aware as we breathe out. and aware as we breathe in. Aware of the beginning of the breath, the middle of the breath, and the end of the breath. Here, when our concentration has slipped, our mind has become distracted, and then gently bringing our attention back to our own breathing.
following the breath calmly as it flows out and as it flows in. So we continue like this for a few more minutes, relaxing with the breath, enjoying the breath. Grateful for the breath.
When you're ready, gently open your eyes. Try to maintain that moment to moment awareness. So, this evening, the topic is transforming obstacles into opportunities. And I do have a PowerPoint presentation. I think everyone likes pictures. We'll start with a few remarks to sort of set the stage for this topic. In the Buddhist teachings, it's very clear that you know, the sufferings, all the problems that we experience, originate in the mind. Um, we can understand that they're not necessarily caused by external conditions, but in fact have their roots in the, in the mind. Now, how do we understand this? There's two different ways I think we can understand this. Well, the first is to understand that all actions proceed from the mind. So all of the actions that we create, a body, speech, and mind, have their origins in our mind and mental factors. And so when the mind is pure, the actions will be wholesome. When the mind is full of delusions, then our actions are likely to be unwholesome. So understanding this, we want to help to uh, purify the mind of mental defilements and According to the Buddha's teachings, this will help to relieve all our frustrations, stress, um, our suffering. And in its place, instead, the wholesome thoughts will create a peaceful, content state of mind. So that's the first way to understand this um, idea that all of our suffering originates in the mind. The other way to understand it is that, yes, given that our stress, our frustration, um, our unhappiness comes from the mind, but the interesting thing is that we tend to elaborate on it. In this way, we sort of increase our own stress. So we might be stressed out already, but then we have to put layers on top of it. So we have an incident, say we get a traffic ticket, and then we think, oh no, now I've got to deal with this, I'm going to be late, I might even lose my job, then I might even get have to pay a huge ticket. and so. In addition to the basic distress of getting a parking ticket, we just elaborate on it and make it more difficult than it needs to be. And we can recognize that we're doing this to ourselves. <laughs> we're creating drama around a simple incident of distress. Of course, it could also be a health problem too. And that's easy enough to do because we get worried, we get anxious, we get uh, afraid that uh, it's going to snowball into something more serious and then imagine what the medical bills are going to be and how much time we're going to have to take off. Before we know it, our mind is spinning out of control, making the situation far more complicated 
than it needs to be. The, the suffering of illness is bad enough already, but we have to add more stress to it. And it's a kind of crazy habit. Uh, but I think the first stage is to recognize how we do this sometimes. Um, the minds of ordinary beings are filled with mental defilements. That's our, that's the human condition. At the moment, we have greed, hatred, ignorance, uh, and pride, jealousy, all of the other emotional afflictions. Um, this is where we begin. This is the, the start of our spiritual journey, is recognizing that. And this is where the Buddha's teachings are so incredibly valuable. They actually explain how we got in this mess in the first place and what we can do to get out of it. I mean, I think this is compounded these days by the situation in the world. Uh, the world's a mess, and what are we going to do about it? Mm -hmm. Well, the most important thing, I think, is to take care of our mind, how we respond to the horrible news that we are faced with every day. Um, of course, we could just party and forget about it all. That's one response. I think um, the musician, the Belgian Rwandan musician, Stromae, does this very well in his um, songs. One says, the world's a mess, let's dance. <laughs> right? Just forget about the whole thing. But the wise will take it a little bit more seriously and take it as an opportunity. Um, yes, we're going to run into all kinds of, of problems in life. That's just the way it goes. And as we were discussing in another venue, um, the idea that all of life is suffering is a misinterpretation of the Buddhist teachings. A lot of criticism has come, you know, all oh, the Buddhists are so negative, they're on such a, a downer. Uh, but that's not ex what the Buddha was really saying. He was saying, not that everything is suffering, because we know that, well, from one point of view, yes, we could say that because everything's leading us into a lot of trouble. But on the other hand, we, we know from our own experience that we experience we have lots of good moments, happy moments, beautiful moments, actually, too. So if we believe that all of life is pure suffering, oh, we'd be so miserable. But what's the point of that? So um, when we look around us, we can obviously see that there are so many problems, and so many of the problems are created by ourselves, right? So. Uh, we can see very clearly how anger, jealousy, greed causes misery. And the beauty of it is that the Buddha gave methods for how to overcome the delusions of the mind, very practical methods. Um, not simple in the beginning, we have to work at it, but very effective, very effective means. I, I can speak from personal experience here, having lived quite a number of years now. <laughs> and I can remember when I was a kid and how completely confused and out of control, angry I sometimes thought at the you know, politics and all of that. And then, fortunately, having the family name Zen, I got into Buddhism when I was very young. and. Trying to follow the teachings of the Buddha, of course, in those days we didn't have well, any teachers in the United States. It was, well, I never met one. We didn't have temples. We had very few books about Buddhism. It's much harder than it is today. Oh, people today don't realize how fortunate they are that there are entire shelves of books that are not only the teachings of the Buddha and translations into our own languages, but also commentaries um, from different points of view that help us to understand those teachings. So they say that the world is a mess, but what we can do under the circumstances is not to ignore the sufferings of the world, 
but to take them as a starting point for turning inside, going inside, learning to control the mind, learning to tame the mind, learning to develop the mind so that we can not only achieve contentment ourselves, but we can also help to bring contentment, happiness, some relief from suffering for others in the world. So, of course, this takes time. Nothing comes easily, right? Just like a musician has to practice eight hours a day, in, in addition to concerts, uh, to perfect his or her art. Similarly, we also have to work hard if we expect to overcome the uh, defilements of the mind, the emotional afflictions that we've spent quite some time building up. So getting free from them will also take some unwinding of the movie, right? But that's a really interesting thing. And um, someone said, the wonderful thing about patience unlike commodities that we buy, is that the more we use it, the more we have to offer. So we, the patience only gets better and better the more we practice it, unlike the ordinary material things of this world, which fall apart. So um, I, I'd like to show you my PowerPoint some slides. Let's see um, if we can get this working. Everybody likes pictures, I think. So I put together this little PowerPoint with this poor guy struggling in the sea of obstacles. <laughs> Let's go from the beginning. Okay. There we go. And yeah, so I start out by trying to explain the nature of the mind and perception. Because of course, all of our, our struggles, the struggles of our, that we endure, come back to the nature of the mind, understanding the nature of consciousness. So, um, we want to learn this, to ride the waves of life. Here I'm speaking to you from Hawaii. We've got lots of good waves here. Uh, and so in order to do that, we need to understand how our mind works. You know? So how do we understand our perceptions? How, does, how do we understand the mind that differentiates one kitten from the other? Now, sometimes I get carried away, sometimes with polar bears, but this time with kittens. So please bear with me, <laughs> because I'm, I'm trying to um, understand the nature of perception, how we view the world, how we view our own mind, how we're going to over understand the obstacles that come our way, and how we're going to try to overcome them or transform them. Huh? So when we look at the outside world, we take it to be real. Often we take it to be real. We get really sucked in by the illusions of the world. So just like the kitten believes that there's another kitten, when actually it's only a reflection of the kitten in the mirror. So it's, it's an analogy. I, I think it's a helpful analogy. Well, puppies do this too. <laughs> so there's a puppy and wants to get to know that puppy in the mirror, but the puppy is not responding. <laughs> so it's, it's an illusion. They get sucked into the illusion of a potential friendly puppy. Okay. So um, this is how we go through life. We see in the outside world and we interpret it in certain ways. But the Buddha was pretty clear that our perceptions are deceptive. Mm -hmm. our, dis our perceptions are all deceptive because they're clouded by the delusions of the mind. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what we, the puzzle that we want to untangle. 
Here's again a little kitten trying to play with a little kitten who's simply a reflection. Our fears also. Sometimes our fears are based on our mistaken perceptions and our anxieties about the outside world. And our perceptions may be completely false, but we buy into them. And then we also internalize these anxieties, these fears. There's another kitten that is startled by its own reflection. Mm -hmm. There's probably an analogy here with social media too, but I don't think I will go there. <laughs> okay, now here's another way that our perceptions fool us. Sometimes we're just a kitten, but we think we're a lion. Okay. Sometimes we can get in lots of trouble that way. We can overestimate. Now there's a danger both in underestimating our capabilities, like the scaredy cat that we just saw. But there's also a danger in overestimating our abilities, right? And that can get us in some trouble too. Um, and then this one says, why is that obnoxious cat always staring at me? <laughs> so there we get into the social media thing about how others perceive us. And that's another tangle another mess to, that we need to untangle. How do we know what other people are thinking, right? We make so many assumptions about what people think about us and um, what they're going to say and what they're going to do. And it's mostly in our imagination. Sometimes we see ourselves as being just a big hot mess, but that probably has nothing to do with reality, right? The Buddha taught us to see things as they are, uh, rather than putting our faith in these illusions. Illusions of grandeur, illusions of inferiority, all illusions. Okay, well, this little kitten's having fun with it, <laughs> even if it's not an, a real kitten. They can play with it. And I think that play and keeping a good sense of humor is probably the most valuable gift in getting through the struggles of life. We take ourselves oh so seriously. I mean, I think especially when we're younger, everything seems so violently, you know, terribly serious. And if we're fortunate and have some good role models, then we can learn to uh, see the, the humor in so many situations, especially ourselves. Mm -hmm. Now, we see ourselves mirrored in different ways through the um, eyes of other people. Again, full of assumptions about how they view us, and also leading to many misunderstandings. Um, we think we understand people, but do we really, do we even really understand ourselves? I think um, I added this one because I thought it's important also in addition to a sense of humor to learn how to relax, relax our preconceptions, mm -hmm. enjoy the moment. So the nature of consciousness is really complicated, but the Buddha described it as the six different kinds of consciousness, the visual and audio, and nose and taste, and feelings, consciousness, mental consciousness. So we want to be able to understand that. He described consciousness as a string of pearls, a string of moments of consciousness, and really not even connected by any kind of solid thread, but one giving rise to the next. He described the mind as being like the clear blue sky, with the thoughts, all the worries, anxieties, delusions of the mind are like clouds that come and go, come and go. Talked about the mind as being like the vast ocean, clear, serene, but disturbed by the waves of 
delusion, and emotion. But the nature of the mind itself is not the waves. The nature of the mind itself is clear and knowing. So here are the six consciousnesses that the Buddha explained, where the eye comes in contact with a visual form that gives rise to visual consciousness. The ear comes in contact with the sound and it gives rise to audio consciousness, etc. with the nose coming into contact with scent, tongue coming into contact with taste, the physical body coming into contact with various sensations, and the mind coming into contact with thoughts, images, memories, and so forth. So, Ah, so where does this anxiety and fear and confusion come from? Well, it's habit patterns that we've built up over many years, and the Buddhists would say many lifetimes. Yeah. So we can understand them first and then try to transform them. Uh, okay, so here's the anxiety T. What if nobody likes me? What if I taste weird? Uh, if I'm cold, what if I'm too hot? What if I'm just right and I can never live up to it again? See, this is the way, this is really kind of a silly cartoon that shows how our anxieties arise and um, fool us. We get crazed by thinking nobody likes me. I'm never going to be able to live up to even good deeds that I've done. Now, this is a serious problem. Just taking the social cost of anxiety in the United States for an example, look at these figures. In 2020, 280 billion US dollars were spent on mental health services. What if we had this money for education in the first place to help us understand the mind? But this is really um, exaggerated. It's really going up because look, in 1990, just 30 years before, it was half of that. It was still a huge number, but it means that anxiety, that mental health problems have doubled in the last 30 years in the United States. And of these mental health issues, anxiety disorders are the most costly almost one-third of the total. Now, of course, these years were COVID years, and the, we can understand that a lot of anxiety was generated by being cooped up inside, not knowing what was going to happen, uh, and that could explain a lot of it. But still, we need to recognize what a huge... Um, issue this in it's given rise to a whole pharmaceutical industry uh, which even children are being given drugs to overcome their anxieties and other uh, issues they're experiencing. Now <clears throat> meanwhile advertising promises us peace of mind. Um, uh, let's see if I can get this I don't want that to go away, but anyway. So advertising is presenting material objects as the solution to all our problems, right? If only we had a car that looked like that, everything would be right with the world. <laughs> yeah, and you're even gonna get four years of service care along with your car. I took this um, image from a billboard in Delhi airport in India. Right nearby it, 
was another poster that advertised Shanti guarantee. So if you're a successful business person, the billboard implies, you'll always have peace of mind. But we know from statistics that that's not necessarily the way it works. But this is the bill of goods that were being sold. Is that happiness comes from material objects. So, and this is trying to sell us a pension plan, of course. <laughs> right. So, as we learn to understand the more the mind better, we understand different aspects of it. Um, to try to see things objectively, that the obstacles we face are not necessarily overwhelming. If we look at them objectively, okay, so we got sick. So that's um, exactly as the Buddha taught. We're all going to get sick. We're all going to get old. We're all going to die. No surprises here. So if we can look at things objectively with equanimity, uh, carefully observing, feeling, sensing, um, we can learn more about the nature of our own mind and how to tame it. Now, there are many different practices that the Buddha taught. Um, awakening to the moment, as we did with our meditation, mindfulness of breathing that we began with. Learning to calm the mind, that would be shamatha practice where we learn to focus single-pointedly, calmly on the object. And particularly Tibetan practice called lojo, training the mind, learning to train our mind. So, you know, we have the same potential that Buddha Shakyamuni had uh, one of my teachers used to say, the only difference between us and the Buddha is that we're lazy. <laughs> we're lazy. We have the same potential for awakening that the Buddha had, but we just haven't put in the effort to chain the mind, to tame the mind. So um, we have practices such as the divine abodings, the four divine abodings, learning to cultivate compassion, learning to cultivate loving kindness, learning to cultivate sympathetic joy and equanimity. This is how we can face the obstacles that come our way when people are unkind to us, when people ruffle our feathers when the ups and downs of life just seem like a, an assault to try to maintain equanimity. So what do these terms mean? I'm sure all of you have encountered them before, but just as a little review here, compassion is the wish that all beings be free from suffering. So now we look at the paper and we see what's going on in Ukraine and in Israel and in so many countries around the world. How do, how do can we deal with that? Well, we can generate the wish, may all beings be free from suffering. We can create an island of compassion in our own hearts, right? And that can help us to cope with all of the the outrage that we feel when we see these terrible events swirling around us. Loving kindness defined as, may all beings be happy. So we try to transform our feelings of despair and, and pain for the suffering of others into this compassionate wish, cultivating loving kindness and generating the wish that all beings be happy. This works really well when people are unkind to us. What do we do with that? It could be our coworkers, it could be our fellow students, it could be 
some random stranger on the bus who must be having a bad day and you know unleashes some words on us and immediately instead of getting upset outraged defensive we can generate the thought ah we all beings be happy we don't have to say a thing it comes from our heart and it generates out to that unhappy person and it's a way of transforming that obstacle, that particular obstacle, into an opportunity for practice. Now, sympathetic joy, there's a few different translations for that, but I like sympathetic joy, is the uh, practice of rejoicing in the qualities and good fortunes of others. Now, this obviously is an excellent antidote jealousy. When we find out that someone else got the scholarship that we applied for, um, someone else got into the class that we wanted to take, someone else got the, the job we were hoping for, uh, we can, it's normal that we might feel disappointed. But instead of generating jealousy toward that person, we can generate a sense of rejoicing in their good fortune. Isn't it wonderful? She got that scholarship. Isn't it great? He got that job. You know, we can transform our unhappy emotions into their opposites, actually. And there are many ways to do this. I find the four divine abidings to be very helpful. And equanimity. Again, in the situation, say, in the family, there's some dispute. What family is free from disputes? And so when difficulties arise among our family, we can try to generate a calm state of mind, an even-tempered state of mind that will allow us to be a resource for others. Calmly, quietly, not in your face, just calmly, you know, trying to understand the situation without getting upset. So that's a way of transforming what could become a disaster. If we allow our emotions to rage out of control, uh, we can create some really sticky situations for ourselves and actually make things much worse than they need to be. So these four divine ab abidings are very, very practical, very helpful. And that's how the Buddha himself became a Buddha. Uh, so we can take him as the example. And we can also try to cultivate these four divine abidings. So that is my PowerPoint. And um, now we could open our discussion up to any questions anyone might have. Um, Thank you. For some, maybe that was, yeah, sure. Yeah, you want to take it from there? Sure, Venerable, it might be easier because I can just read out the questions and oh, you don't have to do that. <laughs> um, okay, great. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, so everyone, if you have any questions about this talk, please feel free to drop them in the chat. And for those in person, we have paper and pens there. So, or you could just come and um, talk as well, um, ask your questions. So yes, if you have any questions, please Feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, Venerable, we already have a question. Um, and this person would like to ask, what is the right way to view this world? As the Buddha said, this life is suffering. How do lay Buddhists view this so we are not drawn by negativity about this suffering thing? <laughs> okay, so you mean how do we cope with suffering? Yeah, I guess what they try yeah. to say is, you know, how do we deal with this suffering thing? Like, yeah. <laughs> okay, that's a good one. Um, 
nice in, in general. <laughs> but, you know, first of all, I would have to say that the suffering of monastics is not different from the sufferings of lay people. Sometimes people look at monastics and think that we've got it all wrapped up. But, you know, just shaving your head and putting on robes does not solve all the problems of the mind. That's just a kind of beginning, right? So um, the nature of suffering is basically the same for all sentient beings, even the animals. I mean, sometimes I watch the animals. I live out in the country and I watch the birds and the bees and all the insects and my puppy and my kitty. And I see, you know, that they are also like bored to tears and they're struggling to get enough to eat. And they're, you know, it's really interesting to watch. It's not just human beings. But so all of these different tools, looking uh, to understand the nature of the mind. Where does suffering arise from? And that was um, the issue with trying to identify where suffering comes from. Um, the delusions of the mind, greed, hatred, ignorance, pride, jealousy. Um, these are the teachings the Buddha gave. But realizing them on a deeper level means that we actually have to meditate on them. So some people might say, well, why in the world would we want to meditate on suffering? And I mean, we're already miserable enough as it is. Why would we want to meditate on suffering? Well, I think there are a number of good reasons. The first is to get some actual realization of the nature of, of our own suffering. Um, because sometimes we're not in touch with it. We live, we live our lives just on the surface. Um, trying to fill our days with nonsense, you know, TikTok or whatever, it's, you know, just to fill the time. People even say time fillers, right? And heaven knows there are enough of those in the world today with uh, all of the social, with all of the digital media. Uh, I, I don't know, you folks have Netflix over there in Australia? You know, it, there's a you can downstream videos, you know, as many as you like, you can binge watch Netflix videos. Uh, there are very few that are really worth the time of day, but people get addicted, you know, like to the Korean soaps and all of this, you know, and it turns out that this big time waste is just a way to escape from the problems of the world and also our own misery, right? So it doesn't solve anything. It's just a timeout. It's actually a time waste. But sometimes we do escape into those kinds of behaviors. Oh, it could be much worse than Netflix, too. I mean, drugs, alcohol, sex, all of it. You know, it can be an attempt to escape our own suffering and ignore it. But I feel the second thing, in addition to learning to recognize our own suffering, um, is the to be able to understand the suffering of others. See, because no matter what we're going through, if we look at the sufferings in the rest of the world, it's unimaginable. How can we even relate to it? So getting in touch with our own suffering helps us to develop compassion for those who are suffering far worse than we are. I mean, killing a thousand children, how can, how can it be? You know, I mean, aren't we supposed to do better than that in the 21st century? And just all of this, it's almost unimaginable. But when we recognize, we don't want to hide our heads in the sand and pretend that suffering doesn't exist. After all, the truth of dukkha, or suffering, was the Buddha's first noble truth. That's the key to the whole puzzle. If we don't recognize the fact of suffering, the truth of suffering, how can we ever overcome it? How can we ever become free from suffering? So these are my initial thoughts on this question. Um, I hope it might be helpful, or maybe there'll be a follow-up. Yeah, a big topic. 
right? Like it's the whole of Buddha's teaching, which is what do we do about suffering? <laughs> so if you have any other, if you have follow-up questions, please feel free to ask it. Um, in the meantime, we also have other questions. So we have a question that asks, can Venerable please share how to practice metta as a meditation if there is time? Can you I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Of course. Can Venerable please share how to practice metta as a meditation, time permitting? Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, there are many ways to practice, many methods for learning how to generate metta. Um, when we were just describing it, um, we were talking about metta as the wish for all beings to be happy, right? So if we look at um, sentient beings, we can visualize them with our mother, our father, our sister, our brother, our friends, and we can try to imagine them happily being happy right um free from suffering of course these are a pair compassion and, and loving kindness are a pair so imagining them free from suffering is the first step and then imagining them as being happy uh, which is not just haha -ha, happy but content contentment is the greatest wealth the buddha said so uh, one method is from the Tibetan tradition is called friend, enemy, stranger. If we had more time, we could practice it. Maybe we could. Um, well, let's, let's take a few minutes uh, to imagine three people in front of us. To the left is someone that we love very much. Not a romantic partner, but someone that we really love with our whole heart without any um, confusion. <laughs> Imagine sending loving kindness to this person that we feel so much love for. Beginning from our heart, And if we like, we can imagine it in the form of a gentle golden light, reaching out to our loved one and surrounding them with loving kindness. Next, we imagine someone that we don't like very much, directly in front of us. Now, this is a, a challenge. Um, it could be someone who has harmed us in some way, lied to us, stolen from us, abandoned us, created problems for us. So we very intentionally want to avoid responding with anger or aversion to this person. We want to very intentionally generate loving kindness toward this person, completely surrounding them with loving kindness from head to toe. If our ill will or aversion pops up strongly again, start again from the heart, generating loving kindness toward that person who has harmed us.
Next, we visualize the person to our right as a perfect stranger. Someone we don't know at all. We've never met them. We don't feel either love nor hatred toward them. And this would be the vast majority of human beings, I mean, 8.2 billion beings that we've never met, we don't even care about. So imagine generating loving kindness for that person. Take one as a representative of the 8.2 billion and generate loving kindness toward that perfect stranger. And last, we generate loving kindness for all three of these people equally. Imagine generating loving kindness to all three of them. No differentiation between the loved one, this so-called enemy, and the complete stranger. Generate loving kindness equally to each one. And then gently open your eyes. So this meditation, generating loving kindness, helps to overcome all aversion and hatred toward anyone. And the benefit is that it opens up so much space in our own heart. We fill our own hearts with loving kindness, and then we can direct it wherever we want to. Um, it's an incredible practice. And this, mind you, is just one way to cultivate loving kindness. 
but it's an important one because, um, you know, if we want to become a Buddha, we need to learn to value all living beings equal and not just human beings, right? Even the cockroaches and the banana slugs and all of the sentient beings. But starting with people even, that seems difficult enough, but it's essential uh, to equalize sentient beings in order to generate the thought of awakening. So it has many virtues, perspectives. And thanks to whoever asked the question. Thank you, Vanessa. Are there some more questions? Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, there's plenty of questions. Um, just as a follow up to the meta practice, one question um, I hear people ask a lot, including myself sometimes, is sometimes meta is too subtle to feel it as a feeling. Yeah, so either we have a really stressful day or we just feel a lot of negative or anger towards someone that is very hard to connect with the feeling of meta. Um, and oftentimes it may feel like you don't want to bypass whatever feelings are rising and repress it with generating meta or compassion and intellectualizing it. So what advice do you have for people that may experience this? Well, my advice would be practice, practice, practice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in the, the, uh, in the taxi, the passenger asked the driver in New York City, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? And the driver said, practice, practice, practice. <laughs> so um, we can't expect to master this all at once. Just like you can't just go on stage and pick up a violin and expect to give a concert. It's not possible. We have to start with wherever we are. And everyone starts from a different place. Some people have had a really rough childhood. They have not been treated by, with love and affection by their families. Whereas others have been really fortunate and grown up in a very loving environment. So in a, in a way, they may have a little bit of a head start. In addition to that, you know, the Buddhists also accept the idea of repeated rebirth. So some of us come into this lifetime with a gentle heart because of our past experiences, and some come in with a more difficult, you know, mentality. And so it really, we really, that's part of getting to know ourselves, getting to know our own minds. But everyone can develop loving kindness. And I feel that uh, one of the best ways is to practice this about five minutes in the morning, five minutes in the evening before you go to sleep. And grab five minutes throughout the day. You know, there's, we waste so much time, you know, just uh, scrolling through our email and all that, you know. Why not take those five minutes to generate loving kindness? And I, most people will find it easier to generate loving kindness toward a loved one first. So you can start with that. And then later you can move on to generating loving kindness for difficult people. Of course, that's very important, but we might not be ready to jump in all at once. <laughs> so that would be my advice, just continuous practice. Don't let a day go by. And especially if you have to go into a meeting that could be very difficult, you're going to meet someone that you've had difficulties with in the past, then you want to make sure to sit down for five or ten minutes before you go into that meeting. Calm your heart. Imagine that person surrounded in loving kindness. And when you walk in, the atmosphere will be very different. Check it out. <laughs> what is magic? It's not, uh, it's not Harry Potter magic, but Buddha's yeah. magic. <laughs> That's the thing. If you walk in a room full of tension, it's uh, not generally a good place to begin. <laughs> right? So, yeah. Beautiful answer. Thank you, Venerable. And we had a comment 
in the comment section saying kitten photos help as well. <laughs> Oh, they do. Yes, you can, you know, if you're really feeling down, you can go and look at some of those silly pictures of kittens and puppies on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe as a Buddhist nun, I shouldn't say that, but I think in this crazy world, sometimes we have to use all the tools at hand. So sometimes it can be, a, it can really relieve the stress to just like laugh. And if you've got friends that you laugh with, you're the lucky one. If you don't, you can go watch the silly videos on YouTube. Only for five minutes, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Daily kitten meditation. <laughs> yes, there we go. You can also generate loving kindness for kittens, you know, and all the suffering of the animals. You know, we just had these terrible wildfires on Maui, and so many animals fried to death it was so sad so we've all been generating meta for the animals and not just the i mean domestic animals but also all of the bugs and you know the ones the sentient beings that we often overlook or even despise so we've been all practicing trying to practice that and so on. that's amazing yeah. thank you <laughs> and um, on this topic as well potentially related. Um, does Venerable have some advice on the conflict in the Middle East? One feels a bit helpless. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Well, it's a really, really difficult situation. It's uh, very complicated. There is a history to every political problem. You know, if we look at, we say, well, why are these people so angry? But then if we educate ourselves and look at the, the history of the region and the interrelationships of, um, you know, colonialism and um, uh, economic deprivation and, you know, people getting their land stolen and people getting, you know, uh, roasted in ovens and we look at the whole picture not just one side and of course our media uh, in the united states it's controlled by six billionaires can we really trust that information or is there a small chance that it might be biased in some way you know so we really have to do our homework to understand the background of some of these situations and not jump to conclusions I think for the Buddhists, the key is that we want to generate loving kindness and compassion for everyone equally. Because no matter what our nationality may be, no matter what our ethnicity may be, or our gender, or so forth, you know, everyone suffers and everyone can be the recipient of our loving kindness. Um, the children are have no, I mean, no blame, no, they're not at fault. And yet they're suffering so much. So this meditation on loving kindness, I tell you, it's so healing. It's, it's really, so that would be the second piece. So educate ourselves so that we don't jump to conclusions about the world situation. We learn more and more. I mean, mind you, I can only take about 15 minutes a day because it's just so heartbreaking, but still, we try to educate ourselves. Uh, and then we learn to generate loving kindness equally for people on both sides, including the perpetrator of the violence. The perpetrators of the violence also need loving kindness maybe more than anyone. So I find these methods really, really helpful. Uh, trying to understand people who who despair. You know, I was at the in Israel uh, some years ago on an interfaith gathering, and they took us to the West Bank, and they took us to a school, a high school. It was a Christian school. And we talked with the students there, and they say, we have no hope. Our only hope is to try to get to the United States. There's no future for us. And that was so 
sad to hear young people, you know, raised in a place where they felt they had no hope, no future. So um, I think trying to understand other people, where they're coming from, and then generate loving kindness for all of them. That's my advice. Thank you, Venerable. Um, yeah, indeed, it's a difficult, difficult situation for those involved, especially, and can be distressing for all of us as well. Um, right. Yeah. Thank you for that advice. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, it's easy to become complacent when you're part of the privileged. I don't wake up to bombs. I don't have to go down and wait for two hours to get a jug of water. So as part of the privilege, sometimes it's hard for us to relate to the sufferings of others. Uh, though having lived in India and Bangladesh and Nepal for what, many years, then you start to get an, a feeling for what it's like. To be, I'll never forget one time I was in Kathmandu and there was um, a march, a demonstration of one million Nepalis. They were starving. They were, they arrived from the mountains and they were as skinny as a stick. They had only one little singlet and one little pair of shorts on and they were all starving while their government was stealing all of the foreign aid that's offered to Nepal. The uh, world, uh, the um, World Bank project to build a dam in Pokhara, only 3% of the money of the millions and millions of dollars got to the project and the local people are starving to death. Well, that demonstration was peaceful. Um, they had no weapons. They had nothing in their hands. They're just standing there skinny as a stick. And they were successful in changing their government. And now, and things improved a little bit. So, but I can never get that image out of my head as um, a picture of the, the sufferings that people are going through. So not to make us depressed, mind you, but to soften our hearts and help us to think not only of our own happiness, but to try to do something to affect the happiness of others. You know, the people who are happiest in this world are the ones who are helping others. That's my experience. Yeah. So I really appreciate, like, you know, I've been in the hospital for two months and I see the, the nurses and the nurses' aides and they always have a smile on their face. Their day is continuously helping other people. And it's difficult work, but I, I really admire them. <laughs> Thank you. And um, I think on that topic as well, um, is, a, is there a balance that, what's your advice on striking a balance um, or perhaps between staying in touch with the suffering of the world through compassion, but balancing it with equanimity um, so that we're not dragged like to hopelessness without equanimity, but we're also in touch with our own suffering and the suffering of the world through that soft heart. Right, right. Well, it is important to strike a balance. And I don't mean that we should, I mean, not everyone is ready to meditate extensively on suffering, mm. but we should introduce the topic. I mean, since it was the starting point for the Buddha's own realization, you know, that was his great First Noble Truth, we really should give it, pay it some attention. But depending on our own mental state, as I say, we're each different, we're each individual. And for some, um, maybe even one minute a day is enough on suffering and then try some other, you know, happier topics. <laughs> but um, 
One thing also we can do in addition to meditation is go out and help people. The needs, there's so many needs in the world. And if rather than sit and worry about them and, and mm, bemoan the world situation, let's go out and do something about it. How about that? You know, a lot of my friends went over to Maui and they, like Suji Foundation had, was donating between eight and $1,200 to each person who'd lost their home. And a lot of my friends would go over, they would pay their own airfare and go over to Maui de Lahaina on Sunday, give up their holiday and go over and get to know the people, listen to their stories, and then give them a card that they could use at the market for food and necessities. And all of my friends came back so just glowing with happiness. It was the most difficult thing most of them had ever done to listen to the stories. And yet it filled their hearts with happiness to be able to help. So that's one thing we could try. Yeah, soup kitchen <laughs> and so forth. Yeah, good. It's beautiful. It's Tony, our own uh, connection with suffering to action and drive to yes. help alleviating the suffering around us. Um, and on that topic, Venerable, we know that you have a charity that we talked about in the beginning, which is India and Bangladesh. Do you want, uh, would you mind sharing a little, little bit about that too? Oh, of course, I'd be happy to. Um, Jamyang Foundation is an education project. You know, um, 30 years ago, women in Buddhist countries didn't get much education, especially Buddhist education. I mean, in some some Buddhist countries, women are systematically locked out of the monasteries. So they don't have a chance to, to learn about Buddhism. And so we decided, well, what's wrong with this picture? So we decided to start some education projects. And now we have 12 monasteries in India, and we've begun quite a few more that many are now acting independently. They're self-sufficient. And in Bangladesh also, we started a number of schools and uh, there are three out of four are still running uh, effectively. And it's just completely transforming the lives of these little girls who otherwise, you know, their parents can't read. And they live in the most, one of the most remote areas of the world um, as Buddhist uh, minorities up along the Bangladesh Burmese border. So we try to help them, and we have uh, projects. You can go to the website, um, jamyang.org, and you can see the different projects that we have. So in the wintertime, they come down to Bodh Gaya, where the Buddha got enlightened, and they debate philosophy together. It's very exciting. And they here for a thousand years, they weren't allowed to learn. Yeah, there was no way for them to learn this. And now they're really becoming champs, you know. The Dalai Lama said, I want you to study well and even outsmart the monks. <laughs> and yeah, and they, they took it seriously. <laughs> so um, I don't know if we can go to the website, but um, maybe yeah. we could try. Yeah. Oh, I guess you'd have to go to the internet first, wouldn't you? Yeah. Um, let's see. Well, I'll. Shall I put it in the chat? Yeah, Zen's actually helped us to put in the chat already a link to Jamyang. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, Jamyang, jamyang.org. Yeah, they, so you can read all about it. And yeah. if you'd like to help, we have a, a vigorous volunteer program. We have, you know, maybe 30 volunteers every year going up to these remote places where, I mean, gee, you know, the... Global warming is really, really doing a number in these areas that the glaciers are melting and without the glaciers, how can you grow food, you know? So life has become very difficult up in these areas. And, you know, here we just turn on a faucet and it comes out <laughs> automatically. But up there, sometimes they have to carry for six kilometers to get their drinking water. 
So um, we, we try to, you know, help them. And it's quite amazing what they're doing. So it warms the heart to see how they can go from, well, not getting any education to becoming superstars <laughs> in just a couple of decades. So, yeah, if anyone would like to help, I would be very grateful. Yeah, please, um, let's put a link uh, in the chat. So if you'd like to check out the project and help as a volunteer donation, please feel free to do so. It's so heartwarming to hear about this. Um, it's like you're like bringing a little bit of sparkle in the world where yeah. they're suffering and doing what you can. And hope we're all inspired to do that in our little corners of the world as well. Um, and uh, maybe uh, uh, we are running out of time, but you also um, have, uh, was it founded the Buddha, the Daughters of the Buddha? And yes, yes, actually I have four nonprofits. <laughs> but, yeah. um, Sakyatita is international. Yeah. And it's um, a way of connecting Buddhist women and men from around the world. We started in 1987 when Buddhist women found that actually they'd been rather neglected and they were lacking educational opportunities and we decided to get together and talk about it. And since that time, and it, the first conference was blessed by His Holiness the Dalai Lama and um, also, Maha, Venerable Mahagoshananda came all the way from Rhode Island to be with us. And um, from that time on, we've met every two years. And the conferences have grown and grown and become so valuable as a link between Buddhists around the world, learning more about each other, uh, encouraging each other, doing research on Buddhist women in different countries and different time periods, uh, translation work, you know, which is, I mean, not everybody in the world speaks English, you know, we have to recognize our privilege again in being English speaking, but not everyone has those opportunities. And so oh, we just had our 18th conference, 17, 18 in Korea, and it was magnificent, uh, more than Oh, 5,000 people. Okay. So we started as just a little group of about 150 people sitting in a circle under a tent in Bodh Gaya. And now it's grown to this international movement, which is so encouraging to women. Now, um, women have, and some men also, have been doing research on the lives of Buddhist women, which unfortunately were neglected in the Buddhist histories. Most of Buddhism is. Uh, a story of, of men's accomplishments. But now they're uncovering the, the stories of women, Buddhist women's accomplishments. And it's very um, remarkable. So that's the work of Sakyadita. Our next conference will be right near you in Sarawak. Where about so, <laughs> yes, it'll be in 2025. And oh. you're all very welcome. Yeah, uh, men, women, lay ordained it's for everybody christians jews muslims everybody is welcome so it's an amazing opportunity and you can see some of the slides i'm just about ready to post some videos also on the website so you can join sakadita and then or just you know send me your email address and i can add you to the mailing list so, yeah Thank you. thanks and then of course here in Hawaii, we have the uh, Sakadita Hawaii, which is a peace project, my peace center. We have five acres here, and we're uh, restoring the earth, creating world peace. That's our motto. <laughs> so if anyone wants to come over and volunteer here, you're also welcome. Want to come play in the dirt and go some, plant some trees? <laughs> Go, for, go ride some waves, physical waves and mental waves. Yeah, it's only 10 minutes away. You can ride the waves. I mean, real waves, <laughs> not just the waves of life. <laughs> well, okay. Yeah, thank you for sharing so much, Venerable. It's always so inspiring to hear about, like, yeah, it's like charity work. It's not easy to get started um, as a charity and to have it self-sustaining, to have the support, to have it growing. Um, 
that's wonderful. Must have taken a lot of efforts, um, hard work, and um, connection with many people, uh, to make it work. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, was there anything else that you would like to talk about with the your other ch charities or just any closing comments before we finish off today? Well, I think um, I think we've pretty much covered uh, <laughs> the topic. But you know, instead of complaining, I think we should just go into action and start, you know, building building connections and helping those in need and. You know, in that way, we're growing a happy heart. We're opening up space in our heart where we can do more valuable projects. And together, we can really make like, huge changes. It's just, it really amazes me too, uh, considering what we started from. And people were so discouraging in the beginning. Oh, no, you'll ne this will never work. You can never do this. It's too um, ambitious. Just give up. Don't do this, you know. But somehow I was so stubborn, you know. <laughs> I just couldn't give up. I just thought, oh no, we got to try. We got to try. And of course, we stumbled many times, and we're working with almost no resources, you know, uh, because Buddhist women don't get much support. Everyone loves to uh, support the, the monasteries, the monks' monasteries. When you try to get some support for Buddhist women, it's very difficult. And so, but we just plowed ahead. And, you know, I remember for, for many years, more than 10 years, we would send out a newsletter and we would start with zero. We had no money at all. We had to start again in order to send out next year's newsletter. But we just kept going. <laughs> and now when I see, oh, so many young people are doing their master's thesis or their PhD, the uh, dissertations on topics around Buddhist women. I'm reading one right now, um, actually from Tasmania. And it's just a, wonderful to see the work they're doing. So encouraging. Very encouraging indeed. And as a woman myself, it's really awesome to see nuns and um, to, to hear from people of this similar gender or sex um, and to know that we are visible in the Buddhist community and in other enlightenment paths as well. <laughs> well sure. Why should we waste half the human resources? Mm. If we can mobilize, you know, here, Buddhist women say there's maybe 600 million Buddhist women in the world. I used to say 300 million. And then it, when I was in China, they corrected me. They said, oh, no, your brochure is wrong. It's not 300. We have 300 million Buddhist women in China alone. Wow. So, oh, okay. <laughs> and so if we imagine that these are women who are already dedicated to living an honest life, to living a compassionate life, to living a peaceful life. I mean, if these women are activated, become more and more active, there, we can make incredible changes in the world. So, of course, men can too, but uh, why not we all work together? That's even better. That's, you know, double the fun. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And um, we are 10 minutes over time, so I'm really sorry, everyone. Please feel free to drop off if you need to. Um, we, we might just close this off, um, Venerable, even though yes. it's a very great conversation. Um, thank you so much for this wonderful talk, the very inspiring talk, the many photos of kittens I didn't know I needed, but love to have in the session today. I feel a lot of joy and meta and connection um, with everyone here as well. Thank you so much for your questions. Um, so before we close off, um, uh, Venerable, would you like to do a dedication of merit? And just noting that you are unwell and still in the hospital and giving this talk, yes. also dedicate <laughs> the merits for your health as well, if that's <laughs> possible. It's fine. Yeah. Sure. Um, just sorry for the voice quality, but okay. So together let's rejoice in the merit that we have accumulated through listening to the dharma 
contemplating the Dharma, putting the Dharma into action. And then we share all of this merit with sentient beings near and far, large and small, visible and invisible. Mm-hmm. By virtue of the merit that we have accumulated, may we achieve the state of perfect awakening in order to liberate all sentient beings from suffering, leaving not one behind. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, very much, Vendorable. Thank you, everyone. Um, so just before we finish off, some usual notice of notifications uh, uh, from, from Meta Center. So we have Every Monday, beginner meditations. Tuesdays, mindful yoga. Wednesdays, um, we have Wisdom Wednesdays. So next week, we have What is Compassion by Aya Adumuti at 7. And um, this start, Saturday, we actually have a koan meditation from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. So we'll be actually visiting a master, Zen master in the Blue Mountains. So if you're interested, please feel free to sign up or let us know. And then on Sunday, next Sunday, the 29th, we also have a temple tour to Chao Miao Zen Center as well. Um, and there we'll be meeting a master from Taiwan and, uh, and also Sister Sophia, who conducts some um, meditation Mondays as well. So if you're interested in that, please feel free to come along. It's always a lot of fun. It will have food for us as well, so that's great. But you also can bring a food offering if you'd like. Um, and without further ado, <laughs> Good night, everyone, and wish you a speedy recovery, venerable, and hope to see you again <laughs> at the center. <laughs> right, Thank you, everyone. <laughs>